Good morning, everybody. Would you open your Bibles to James chapter 2? And while we're doing that, let me say also good morning to V2 and to Calvary North. James chapter 2, our passage of Scripture today. And I'm, I'm going to read the entire passage before we get started. And so we'll begin in verse 1. James 2, 1 says this. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray together. Father, we've read your words, and so now I ask that you would help me to share the things you've shown me in them today with these friends of mine. Lord, cause us today to honor your word as such. Cause us today to see the glory of Christ and to respond in adoration, to cherish, to love, and to serve, and to honor what you cherish, love, and serve, and honor. And now I pray simply that you would speak to me and through me and the remainder of this service. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, uh, some of us at Calvary, I was one of them, uh, participated in a mentoring program at Marshall Middle School. And so the way that it worked was you were assigned, you had a, you had a team. Uh, in, in my case, I had a partner. His name was Jerry. And Jerry and I would show up at Marshall Middle School at the appointed time, and we'd file into the uh, library there. And we would sit around this little table with uh, four other middle schoolers. They were, I want to say we had one seventh grader and the rest were eighth graders. I think that was the mix, but you get the picture. So there we are, and the purpose of this program was to focus on character development. And so each week, we'd go in there and we would talk about different aspects of what it means to be a person of character. So things like integrity, or honesty, hard work, taking responsibility, all these Uh, virtues that uh, make up what it means to be a person of of character. And there were a number of things that stood out to me about that experience, uh, but one of them was, I I don't know what I expected, but I, but I, I think it has to do with this, and I want you to come there with me mentally, okay? These same boys had just left, you know, the lunchroom, okay, eighth grade boys in the lunchroom, Maybe the locker room, right? But just we travel with me to where their minds were, <laughs> okay? And then they would come into this library, and they would sit and look at um, a couple of people that were much older than them and who probably couldn't understand much of what they were going through, and they would sit there and talk with us about things like integrity. And you know what struck me was how each week, and especially as the semester went on, that we would set before them some aspect of virtue and that they were attracted 
I mean, it was incredible that the, the, the idea of being a purse of integrity was something that you could tell they really wanted. And yet, at the same time, you could tell there was a, a tension happening as we talked through things, that there was something else they wanted. In fact, uh, there were things that were very much not virtuous that they wanted. And here, there was this collision of value systems, and in one sense, you could see very, it was true to say they wanted both, but of course they couldn't have both. And I, I remember one of the other uh, memories from that time that this has stayed with me is this, just this desire to do the ghost of Christmas future thing. If I could just take you forward in time to five minutes after high school and you could see the world there, <laughs> so much of what you value would change right now. It would, it would totally change the way that you see the world. And as I think about the text that we're coming to today, the fact is that a collision of value systems with implications for the future, that's not just something that middle school boys have to face. That's something that every human being that God has ever made has to face. And we find it in our text today that all of us have to face a choice between opposed or antithetical value systems. And in particular, that faith in Jesus Christ involves a transformation of what we value. It's a, it's a complete bottom-up reorientation of what we care about. Or to put it another way, and this is James's language, he talks about receiving the word, receiving the gospel. Receiving the gospel involves receiving a new value system. It involves more than that, but it involves at least that as well. That there's a change in how we think and our attitudes and how we view the world. And that that change is a change that, that brings us into conformity with the way that Jesus lived and with what he taught. And so the, the way that we're going to proceed through this today, there are going to be three sections in the passage we just read. And in each one of those sections, we're going to consider the question, uh, when value systems collide, what happens? And in the first section that we're going to look at, when value systems collide, we're going to see that we need to beware of divided hearts and divided churches. Now, let's look at that text again, and I'll show you what I mean. Two one, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, I'm holding faith in the glorious Lord, with an attitude of personal favoritism. Don't do that. And then the example, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions or divisions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now, what James says here is that there are two things that you can't have at the same time. And one of those is faith in our glorious Lord Jesus. And the other is what the NASB renders as an attitude of personal favoritism. Now in just a moment, we're going to look at this example and we're going to see that fleshed out in the example. What does James mean by, quote unquote, an attitude of personal favoritism? But before we look at the example, there's something in, in verse 1 that's really important for us to pick up. And it's this title that he uses for Jesus. I don't know if you noticed that. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. That title signals where he's going. And so it's about the fact that when we look at Jesus, we ought to see a certain kind of worth. We ought to see glory. And in fact, I don't know if you know this, but our salvation in, in Paul's letter to uh, the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, our salvation is described as seeing the glory of God in Jesus Christ and being transformed by that sight. That's what it means to be saved. I have seen Jesus for who he really is, and I can't be the same after that. But it's, I was thinking about examples of this, and one of the texts that stands out to me is actually a Shakespearean text. All of us read it. It's not obscure. All of us read it in high school, or I think. Romeo and Juliet, did y'all read that in high school? Am I the only one? Come on, guys. All right, good. Some of you did. I'm getting nervous for all the language arts, uh, humanities teachers of the world. But uh, the, the way this story opens up, is it's, it's, it's a play, and, uh, and Romeo is pouting. 
That's, it basically opens up with Romeo pouting. And he's pouting because he's really attracted to a, a woman named Rosalind. And Rosalind is not interested in him. Um, and probably he should have learned something from, from Rosalind and the story should have been different from there on out. Um, but I can't get into that. At any rate, um, he's pouting. And so his buddy says, hey, Romeo, here's what we're going to do. I've heard there's a party happening down the street. Let's go to the party. You'll see somebody that blows Rosalind out of the water, and it'll all be good from here. And so sure enough, they go, they go, and he says, no, there's no way. There's nobody fairer than Rosalind. He gets to the party, and whom does he meet? Juliet. And he sees Juliet, and then he starts to wax poetic. But soft. What light through yonder, <laughs> right? All this starts to happen because he has seen a glory that far outshines Rosalind, and now the whole world looks different. Something like that is in our text. It's signaled when he says, don't hold your faith in our glorious Lord. The idea is that if you are enraptured by what you see in Christ, it ought to affect other things that used to hold your attention, right? And so C.S. Lewis described his conversion this way. He said, I believe Christianity as I believe the Son, Not only because I see it, but because I see everything else by it. And it really is like that for us. In the light of the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, the way that we see everything else changes. And and James has signaled this by describing our faith in this glorious Lord that we have. Now, consider his example. What happens if you're all at church... And in walks a man whom everybody can see, this is an important person. This guy has his stuff together. He's well-to-do. He is, and the the, the translation I'm reading sort of obscures it. In the original language, he's described as having gold rings, which is there. But his clothes are not just fine. They are gleaming. They're glowing. This guy walks in and there is glory. I mean, he is shining, right? Everybody looks, ah, he's glowing. And everybody's awed. And then in walks another man, and well, his clothes aren't glowing. And he doesn't have any rings on. And James invites us to consider, as we listen to this little short story, what's going to happen next. And what happens next reveals exactly what is going on in one's heart. And it's not a pretty picture. He says in, in verses 3 and 4, uh, that that what, is, what happens is that it said to the one, you belong here, and it said to the other, well, you belong over there. And we say, well, well now, on what basis was that? Dis- how, how did they know who belongs here and who belongs there? And, of course, the answer is by exactly the same calculus that happens everywhere else in this world. The values of the church are exactly the same as the outside world in this example. And thus the judgment of verse 4. Only evil thoughts. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Only evil thoughts can explain how a Christian or how a church reinforces a value system that is utterly antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ, utterly opposed to His glory. And I want to be careful here because we moderns, we're not different. It may not, you know, we may not come in shining in our clothes and we may not wear rings on all our fingers. But being important, wealth and power and influence and status and acclaim, none of that has lost its appeal. And so, in just a few moments, these people... In James' example, we'll be singing words of adoration about what they cherish in their glorious Lord. And right here, what is it that they cherish? Where is their adoration? Centered. And so Jesus says this, or James says this kind of double-mindedness reflects a heart divided between what really matters and some cheap imitation. And now where James goes next is to explain that when value systems collide in this way, that the gospel is at stake. The gospel is at stake. Look with me at verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world 
to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Now, when value systems collide, the gospel is at stake. The gospel is at stake in what we value. That would be another way to say it. The gospel is at stake in what we value. So we have in this example that what is considered of little or no account in the eyes of the world is the very thing that God values. The, 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 the one who is assigned a seat on the floor in the back is the one that God has chosen to entrust with the incalculable riches of his kingdom and given an everlasting place of significance before the Almighty. The contrast then is between what they are to the world, either one of them, what they are to the world and what they are to God. Or to say it another way, the contrast, either one of them, is in what they are in the world and what they are in God's kingdom. Now, do you see it? Do you you get the point? Do you see the point that the Scripture is making here? That faith in Jesus Christ, belief in the gospel, entails Jesus' value system. It's impossible for us to cherish Jesus and not to cherish what he cherishes. That's the point, isn't it? And that if we say we cherish Jesus, but we don't cherish what he cherishes, well, we're we're Christians in name only. Now, I think we do have to ask a question of this passage, though. Why the poor? Why the poor? Why does it say that God has chosen the poor? Is this a kind of ancient identity politics? Maybe what Nietzsche called slave morality? What is this? Why the poor? Why has God chosen the poor? Now, to answer this, I'm going to give you some background that comes from the teaching of Jesus. I'm going to set two statements. And by the way, James is strongly influenced, his letter is strongly influenced by Matthew's gospel. And these two texts come from Matthew's gospel. And I'm going to set two passages, two statements that Jesus makes in juxtaposition. You're going to see both of them, and you're going to say, how do those fit together? And then we're going to think about how they fit together. So here's the first, Matthew 19. 23 and 24, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that sounds pretty hard, right? His disciples figured as much out. They said, that sounds impossible. And Jesus said, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible, so don't lose heart. Now, here's the next, that's the first statement. Here's the next statement. Matthew 21, 31, just two chapters, a little bit down the page, Jesus teaching again. And he says this, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. The you in this verse is the scribes and the Pharisees, the uh, religious and civil leadership within Israel. These are social elites, religious elites. Tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to get into the kingdom of God before you. Now, for our purposes, I'm really interested in that bit about the tax collectors. Because I heard that it was hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And now we're talking about the tax collectors who were, they were called publicani. They were administrators of the Roman uh, uh, tax system. And they were wealthy people. These were people who had made a mark, who had been able to get into a position of influence by their wealth. And often they weren't only wealthy, but they were known to be shady in their dealings. So I want to ask the question, how can Jesus say on the one hand that the wealth of the rich is such a risk to their souls that it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for them to get into heaven, and then to say that some of the most wealthy and unscrupulous businessmen in his day were entering into God's kingdom. How do those two fit together? And the answer is this, that underneath all of that is the fact that God has chosen to give his kingdom to the poor in spirit. Matthew 5, 3 says as much. Jesus opens his accounting of the gospel by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But don't miss this. Don't miss this. So common, so often, do we get in love with wealth 
So easy is it for us to fall in love with wealth that very often the materially rich are not poor in spirit. But what God has chosen in this passage is to give his kingdom to those who are rich in faith. Let's read it again. Look at verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world or the poor in the eyes of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Rich in faith. Meaning their wealth, their riches, what God has entrusted them is because of faith. It's their faith in him that makes them rich. And you see the same emphasis in Jesus' ministry. Nowhere does Jesus, somebody comes up to him and he says, hey, your poverty has saved you. Find it for me. What does he say? Your faith has saved you. Nowhere does somebody come up to him and he says, your wealth has saved you. What does he say? Your faith has saved you. Nowhere does somebody come up and he says, your goodness has saved you. What does he say? Your faith has saved you. Your accomplishments, your intellect, your being a decent guy, none of it. Your being a horrible guy, none of it. Your faith has saved you. That's the emphasis in Jesus' ministry. That's what makes you rich in God's kingdom here in the text of James as well. And it caused Jesus, he was strikingly impartial. I mean, people could not figure out what to do with him, right? You read the New Testament, you say, people were thrown off by Jesus a little bit, right? Why? Because he showed compassion to the lepers. And some people said, yeah, that's the right thing to do. And other people said, that's kind of weird. And then he showed compassion to leaders and to powerful people. And some people said, that's not the right thing to do. He never minced words about sin, no matter who he was talking to, whether it was a powerful person or a, or a poor person. He chose disciples with no pedigree. He dined with publicani, tax collectors and sinners, and with scribes and Pharisees. He couldn't be put in any box that made sense to anybody. You know Why? Because his value system was so different from the world around him. And so it should be also with us, brothers and sisters. The gospel is at stake in what we value and what we cherish. Look where he goes next in the scripture in verse 6. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name, that's Jesus' name, the fair name by which you have been called? Now get, get, get what James is saying. Here the church is in the position of reinforcing the mercilessness and blasphemousness of the worldly attitudes and values of those who are rich in the eyes of this world. And they're doing that in church. But you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. So that through his poverty, we might become rich. Though he was Lord, he served. He would teach. He had multitudes hanging on every word he said. Luke said one time, people were so crowded, they were stepping on one another. Trying to get near to him, trying to hear him, trying to be in his presence. And you know what else? He could teach like that and draw a crowd like that, but he would teach children. And Pardon me, ladies, but he would teach women in a day when important rabbis, I mean, can you imagine? Here's this big important rabbi that everybody wants to listen to, and he's sitting in a living room teaching Mary. These are our values, brothers and sisters. He extended a hand to the leper and a kind word to the outcast. He scrubbed the sinner's feet and then he picked up his cross and carried it for him. These are our values, brothers and sisters. And the truth is that the gospel is on display in what we value. 
the gospel is on display in every kindness that we pay to someone who can never repay us. The gospel is on, on display when value systems collide. There's a wonderful illustration of this in a book by the name of Every Good Endeavor. It's a pastor in New York City named Tim Keller. He wrote this book. It's about how to marry your Christian faith and your what you do as vocationally, what you do for work. And there's an example he tells where he describes a situation where, you know, he's up in, in, in preaching in his church and he notices each week there's this, there's this woman who's obviously visiting our church, but she gets up and she darts out the back door, you know, but when it's right when it's over and doesn't really interact with anybody. And so um, one week he says he intercepts her. I don't know what he did, but he intercepted her, okay? So he intercepts her and... Um, if you're visiting with us, don't worry. I, don't, I haven't planned for anybody to be waiting to intercept you at the door. But, um, <laughs> but I would love to visit with you if you want to talk to me. At any rate, um, so he intercepts her and he asks her, hey, what brought you here to, to our church? And she says, well, I don't really believe any of this yet, but uh, here's what happened. Um, I took a job not long ago. It was a firm in Manhattan. She had taken this job. And not long after she'd taken this new job, she made a really big mistake. A big, so big a mistake, and he didn't describe the mistake, but so big a mistake that she really thought she was going to lose her job. Instead of losing her job, she watched her supervisor go in before his superiors and to take all the blame and responsibility for her mistake on himself. She was floored by it know what to do with it she of course went after the fact went to him and thanked him and began to press him why did you do that she said what we're used to uh, I think all of us who've lived for five minutes in this world are used to she said I was used to my supervisors taking responsibility for my accomplishments never before in my life have I seen a supervisor take the blame for my mistake And so she's pressing her boss about this. And she said he was very modest and deferential and didn't didn't really want to. But she kept pressing and he said, here's the thing is I'm a Christian. And one of the things that that means is that Jesus Christ took the blame for me. And because of that, I have the desire and sometimes the ability. Now that's honest the desire, and sometimes the ability to take the blame for others. And here's this woman, no faith in Jesus, and what does she see? A glory in that. And she pauses for a moment and stares at him and says, where do you go to church? You know, when our lives, when the gospel is on display and what we value, our words about the gospel will carry so much weight. The last thing we see in this text is that when value systems collide, no one can serve two masters. Now, I want to tell you, as we uh, look at this last section, uh, this is one of these sections, and it's true of people, re- scholars write about James, and they, uh, they have a lot to say about how hard it is to figure out how things connect together. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how things connect together. If you have more questions, you can ask me later. But this is one of those passages people have a a tough time with. One of the things that's tricky about it is he starts to talk about law. And I need to tell you that if you'd read the letter before you came today, you'd you'd know that if you'd read it closely and seen it recently, that James uses various phrases interchangeably to describe the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in chapter 1, he can say um, the uh, word of truth. He can talk about the word of truth, and he can talk about the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Uh, This is the gospel. Obviously, this is what he's talking about, the saving message of Jesus. And then he can turn around and talk about that same word of truth, that saving word, and he, he can call it the perfect law of liberty. Now, that should be interesting to you, having just read this passage, because in this text, he starts to talk about the law, and at the end of it, he calls this the law of liberty. Now, all, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm justifying my claim, which is correct, and I'd like to talk with you more about it if you don't follow it, that all throughout this letter, James uses different terms 
but he's still talking about the message of Jesus Christ. The royal law is Jesus' message. The law of liberty is Jesus' message. It's the gospel of the kingdom, as the, as the New Testament uh, gospel authors would have described it. And so what he says here is he puts on the one hand this royal law, this gospel of Jesus, this message about our glorious Lord, and on the other hand, he, he puts that there and he says, if you're fulfilling that, then there's no way you can dishonor the poor man. Why? Because those two things are utterly opposed to one another. The gospel of Jesus is not a value system that's dominated by wealth and power and status and selfish ambition, is it? The gospel of Jesus frees us from bondage to that worldly stuff that shrivels our souls and distorts the image of God in us and lifts us up to take responsibility for a broken world. Now, what fulfills the royal law in a word? Love. Love expressed in compassion, expressed in mercy, expressed in caring, in kindness. And hear this, it's in 126 and 27, hear this, expressed in holiness. Pure and undefiled religion is this, brothers and sisters, that you visit orphans and widows in their distress and what? That you keep yourself unstained from the world. Compa- love expressed in compassion and in holiness. Now, don't misunderstand the passage. It's not about perfection. It's about sincerity. It's not, well, I believe the gospel and I'm, I'm living my life according to the gospel, but you know what? I broke a commandment and so I, 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 God's going to judge me for that. That's not the point. It's not at all the point. The point isn't about perfection. It's about sincerity. The point is that we can't compromise the gospel at any point and still have the gospel. When we're willing to compromise the gospel at any point, we're guilty of compromising it all. And in the words of James, all such religion is worthless. Now this, I think, is the meaning of verse 13, where he says that we ought to speak and act as though to be those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does... What does he mean by that? What is that about? How does that fit with the gospel of grace? Here's how it fits. There's a principle all through the scripture and it's woven into the fabric of creation. And the principle is this, that whatever a man reaps, he will sow. That is woven into the fabric of this world. And so what James is pointing out is that we can talk about faith in our glorious Lord, but whatsoever a man sows, he will will reap. In other words, God is not mocked by mere professions of faith. God is not mocked by calling Jesus Lord and and adoring him with words and then cherishing the the basest pleasures in this world. Jesus' message then is not a charge for us to go talk and score points on social media. It's a message for us to live sincere lives, powerfully uncompromised, not perfect, but uncompromised lives, lives of sincerity. Talking about what we value, what we cherish, what we work for, what we pray for, what we sacrifice for, what we, what we live for. Now, at the 9.30 hour, I, I mentioned that I'd gone to see a beautiful day in the neighborhood and everybody looked at me like they didn't know what I was talking about. Is that true of y'all too? No, okay, y'all know? All right, I don't know what it was, but it was, it was striking. <laughs> like, man, because I go to the movies maybe twice a year. So when I go, I think everybody's gone, you know. (laughs) I guess I should have been tipped off by the fact that there was, now we went at like a matinee hour, but there was one other person or two maybe that one body I didn't see, but, and then, and then me and Melissa and her dad (laughs) in the whole theater. But, but uh, at any rate, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is what was striking, and you should go see it if you haven't, what was striking about the depiction of Fred Rogers and his interaction with this journalist uh, from uh, Esquire magazine was, to me, what was interesting was he was described as a kind of hero who lived a life that was so far above what people around us lived. And the journalist asks his wife about that, you know, like he's going to get the inside goods. And she says, she says to him, no, it isn't like that. He practices this. He gets up every day and he practices his commitment to kindness 
He gets up and he reads his Bible and he prays for people by name. It's a powerfully uncompromised life, but his wife says, it's not a perfect life. It's a principled life, but it's not a perfect life. Brothers and sisters, I think that's the way God's designed it. None of us are living perfect lives, and the people around us wouldn't understand it if we did. But you know what they understand when we come and we live powerfully principled lives? When our values line up with Jesus Christ, they understand that the glory of Christ is real. That's the word for us, brothers and sisters. Let's go and do likewise. Pray with me. Father, it's been our privilege this morning to gather together as the church of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ.